uh, those of you who are not familiar with us, um, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background information here after I go over the uh, the um, objectives. And the objectives are basically, I think, when you signed up for register for the webinar, um, it was listed there. The, really, the goal of the webinar today is to provide you with some assistive technology information and resources so that you can. Um, Leave the webinar today feeling like you can uh, have a few more um, devices and solutions that you can apply to some of the students that you're working with um, in regards to perhaps some applications that they can utilize that would be appropriate for them for um, reading and writing in the areas of math, um, as well as daily living skills and independent living skills and some task management, um, <clears throat> excuse me, solutions for task management. As I said, um, I work for WATAP, and what we do here at WATAP is um, all about assistive technology. We are a federally funded um, program. Every state has a federally funded AT program. Um, we are housed at the University of Washington, and um, the primary goal of WATAP is working with individuals across the, the lifespan. So we work with kids and older adults um, in all areas of disability. So our core programs are are, are client-centered and are, again, only uh, are in inclusive to Washington residents. So if we have an individual that's contacting us from um, Idaho or Oregon, we would refer them specifically to their uh, state AT programs. So the majority of our programs are either uh, free or low cost to a consumer or an individual with a disability. That includes our device um, demonstration program, our information or referral uh, and reuse. Uh, let me talk briefly about those. So uh, the demonstrations um, and our device lending, which has a small uh, administrative fee, um, is intended to provide the individual with a disability an opportunity to try the equipment to help in the decision-making process. As it says here, there's no cost for the demonstrations. Um, there is a low cost for the fees for borrowing a piece of equipment. All of our equipment uh, inventory is online. Uh, we do have um, an agreement with SETSI so that if they don't have a particular piece of equipment in their lending library, then you can uh, go ahead and contact us. And uh, I, I work with Sue to determine whether or not they're going to cover that lending fee. Um, that fee covers all round-trip shipping costs for that particular device. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on that, but if you do have some questions pertaining to what we have available, um, you can always um, send us an email or give us a call, and I'd be happy to talk with you further about that. I mean, in general, um, if you are kind of stuck and not really sure what direction you need to go with with a student, you can always give us a call, and we can do a consultation on the phone. Uh, we, that oftentimes falls under the category of information and referral. Other programs that might be of interest to you um, currently or at a later date is my colleague, Naomi Namakata, and manages low vision and deaf blind programs. That's the independent living program and I can connect. Um, those programs are um, have different funding than the one that comes through WATAP, uh, and they have certain uh, criteria associated with them in order for clients to be uh, qualified for those programs. And again, um, I encourage you to just give us a call if you are working with students who have visual impairments. Um, and lastly, um, realizing that the school districts uh, have a certain amount of funding to purchase equipment. Um, if for some reason you're working with a student and a family and they need some additional funding for, for assistive technology, the, the Northwest um, Access Fund uh, is one of our partners and they can work with individuals to acquire um, low interest loans to purchase assistive technology. Uh, moving along um, and changing gears a little bit, um, again, I would encourage you that if you just have some general questions about AT, that's what we're here for, um, to give us a call. Um, and at the conclusion or the last slide of the presentation today has all our contact information. Um, so moving ahead, uh, I, don't, I realize that a lot of you probably know um, perhaps a lot about AT. Um, 
we tend to uh, spend some time in regards to identifying some of the challenges and barriers as to why AT is not successful for individuals. Up to at least half of the assistive technology um, uh, oftentimes is abandoned for various reasons. Uh, the biggest reasons typically are the result of the fact that the person was not provided with um, a good AT evaluation to begin with and their, their needs in regards to functional need wasn't uh, quickly address in the beginning of the process. We are big advocates that we can minimize this abandonment rate if the individuals um, are provided, depending on the type of AT they need, if they're provided with a good solid AT assessment in the beginning, and if they are able to, if you see that second bulleted item, is to be able to try the equipment in the various environments in which they're going to utilize that piece of equipment. And that's where the AT uh, programs um, in each of the, of the states can be useful in helping reduce reduce that abandonment rate. Again, what drives us in the field of assistive technology and, and, and gaining successful outcomes is focusing on function um, and not so much getting stuck and bogged down on what the latest and greatest piece of technology or tools that are out there. Uh, we're firm believers that uh, that technology comes in three categories. It can be low tech, medium tech, or high tech. And in this case, if the students that we're working with are functional and min meeting the uh, goals that are set out for them and that they are setting out for themselves, then that is uh, certainly acceptable. We don't have to go out and try to push uh, a piece of technology or, or a tool that is beyond perhaps their cognitive capacity or even their physical capacity to be um, to try to use that when, when their low-tech solution is, is completely adequate. So on this slide here, again, we're focusing on, on function. And when we do an assessment, we're looking at, um, uh, looking at the functional assessment of the, of the individual. We're looking at, especially if we're starting to look into something more high tech, if the skills necessary to use the assistive technology, do they have the ability to use this technology across the environments in which they're going to uh, need their, uh, their AT? And how motivated are they? Uh, we don't want to spend money if we know that the individual or the student in this case is not going to be um, motivated or interested in using their technology. Uh, so we need to go back to the beginning stages and try to determine what is um, going to get the buy-in from the end user uh, so that uh, we uh, have greater um, sense of success. Again, realizing that you guys are um, in the field of education and you understand the transition process, um, so what I want to emphasize on this slide is not so much that you all know, I realize you all know when the transition process should start, but I want to focus on the fact that transition, uh, I mean, assistive technology plays a significant role with individuals or students with disabilities and being successful in accessing curriculum and being dependent across their lifespan. And so we're looking at assistive technology that can uh, help them be successful in the educational process, uh, to help them um, be successful and independent um, in self-care skills, as well as um, if they're transitioning to post-secondary or even a um, uh, job setting, uh, so looking at job and work site accommodations and modifications that would allow them to be successful. So, so those are just some of the things that I will be highlighting today in some of the, um, in the slides as we go through the various categories of assistive technology. So these are the general categories um, that we tend to talk about when we talk about uh, the various areas of AT. Um, computer access is a big one, communication, um, technology that can assist a person who has visual um, and, and or hearing loss and mobility loss. And daily living, cognition, learning, and memory, and recreation. For the purpose of today's webinar, I'll be focusing a lot on computer access, uh, communication, and not just excuse me, not just verbal communication, um, but also how hearing loss can affect a person's ability to communicate their needs um, as well. Um, some vision technology, uh, things for self-care and independent living and learning and cognition. Uh, I'm not uh, prepared today to, to go great 
deeply into recreation, although by me not doing that does not mean that I don't think that that's an important part of, uh, of our lives. But that's for another conversation and another webinar. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first um, area is um, computers. And I tossed in there because a lot of individuals and students are now also having to utilize mobile technology, so tablet access. Um, so when we talk about computer access, I, I think there's a lot of individuals who are very um, familiar with using their voice as a means for uh, accessing their computer or speech recognition. There's a variety of peripherals um, available, whether we're looking at um, alternative keyboards, pointing devices, meaning um, alternative uh, mouse devices, um, and I'll review those um, here in a minute. And also, not to forget the importance of of how we mount those, uh, perhaps uh, the keyboard or the or the input device, especially for those students that we're working with who have mobility limitations, um, and so that they can actually be successful in accessing their alternative uh, devices. Um, and then the switches, uh, the wired switches, and with the use of mobile technology, the importance of having reliable Bluetooth connection switches. So on this slide, it's a smattering. So what I want to convey on this slide is when we talk about keyboards, there's a number of keyboards that are available. There's um, large keyed keyboards for individuals um, who are uh, who have visual impairments. Uh, there's a cross application for using a large keyboard, not just for individuals who are visually impaired, but for, for, for individuals who might have some fine motor um, challenges um, and using a keyboard with larger targets can increase their accuracy um, in keyboard strokes. Um, Again, I want to emphasize that if you do have a student that is struggling with keyboarding, you can always contact us, and we have a number of keyboards available for, for students to try out. Uh, the one that you see on the far right-hand side, um, the black one, that is a half QWERTY keyboard. And what I want to say about that one is um, there's a, there's a number of dedicated one-handed computer keyboards that are out there. Many of them require significant cognitive loads because it requires a lot of relearning of keystrokes. Many of the keys or many of the one-handed keyboards um, require that the individual um, be able to understand and utilize uh, that uh, that the one key can have multiple functions. So that's where that new learning is really significant. And so if we're working with individuals who have any sort of uh, motivation in learning new, uh, reduced motivation in learning new things, or if they have uh, moderate to significant cognitive um, limitations, this isn't probably a particular type of keyboard that you're going to want to try with your student. Um, the other keyboards that we get asked about frequently are ergonomic keyboards. So the, the, the term ergonomic is really intended to uh, describe that the piece of equipment should allow the end user to minimize their exposure to um, awkward and oftentimes repetitive motion to try to reduce the stress and strain on their muscles, joints, and ligaments and tendons. So with ergonomic keyboards, oftentimes that is um, really designed to help with placing their hands and wrists in a more favorable position to minimize those exposures and those risk factors. So again, um, when I do an assessment for an individual, uh, adult or student, and we're looking at alternative keyboards, I oftentimes um, will determine what the limitations are, what the functional goals are, what the barriers are, and then have them try out various keyboards to determine what's going to be the most successful for them and get their buy-in on it. Uh, when we talk about keyboards, just because somebody has um, an uh, hand injury, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all going to gravitate towards uh, a particular one-handed keyboard. So uh, there's a lot of variety, um, again, depending on the individual. It's very individualistic. In regards to positioning, um, 
there's uh, on the top right hand corner, that's an ergo arm. Oftentimes we'll use that for individuals who have a difficult time with holding their arms up in space or against gravity and allowing them to have that kind of uh, articulating uh, mobile arm support will allow them to be successful in accessing their desktop keyboards and or their desktop mouse device. Um, we oftentimes will also use uh, mo articulating monitor arms for those students who have some postural and positioning challenge uh, due to um, perhaps if they're, they are a wheelchair user um, or they have low vision or some visual impairments and we are able to make a lot more adjustments um, in the monitor height by having this kind of system. Um, the last thing uh, on that slide I want to address is the JCO arm. Um, that is another type of arm support for, for individuals who have a lot of upper arm um, weakness and um, in being able to mount that onto a chair um, can provide some increased function in the upper extremities depending on the limitations of the individual. Moving along to mouse options. Uh, the one thing I want to say about mouse options, aside from the fact, just like keyboards, there's many, many options that are out there. If we can, when we're talking about computer access, if we're working with an individual um, who has perhaps uh, significant paralysis, but if they have reliable movement anywhere, whether that's their ability to move their eyebrows up and down, um, stick their tongue out, uh, control something with their chin, if that is a reliable point of um, muscle movement, then choosing, uh, getting them set up with the appropriate mouse option um, and an on-screen keyboard, they can certainly be independent with computer access. So with that being said, um, again, uh, again, just trying to match up depending on the functional limitations and barriers of the end user, we might go with um, uh, trackball options and selecting um, if they are able to navigate the mouse pointer with a mouse but I can't do the clicking we can always obviously select and choose some larger targets such as jelly bean switches on there as you see there um, we get a lot of requests for head control options so there's head mouse options that are available uh, which uses the infrared system um, with the decreasing cost of eye gaze. Um, there have been situations, especially with individuals with spinal cord injury, uh, significant upper extremity paralysis are using um, eye gaze systems to control not only their computers but also their um, speech generating devices. So again, um, lots of different options. Sip and puff is what you see up in the middle there. The quad joy, that's a mouth controlled joystick. Um, so it really determines, again, what the, the type of uh, functional ability the person has, which, which will oftentimes lead us to the type of mouse control that the person is going to be the most accurate and successful with. Um, I tossed in, this is called the gla glass house. So this is a fairly new um, wearable hands-free uh, mouse device. It's one of my newest favorite pieces of assistive technology. It's a Bluetooth mouse. So basically in this photo you see um, the student is wearing it like a pair of glasses. The black bar that you see right above his eyes is actually the mouse tracker. You, that is the only thing that you, the end user has to wear. Um, it is connected through Bluetooth. Uh, the switch option that is being used in this example is a bite switch. Um, there are other ways, there are other uh, options that can be chosen. Uh, they can control it with a foot switch that can be purchased through the company as well as a sip and puff switch. I can tell you that the setup for this is extremely easy and it's extremely um, intuitive to use and I've not had any issues with connection with it. Um, it's compatible with any Bluetooth device, uh, PC and Mac. Um, and Android tablets and Android phones. It is not compatible with iPhones or iPads because those systems are closed. The other um, Bluetooth switch that is uh, 
viable with using um, with both iOS and this actually device this uh, switch actually works with iPhones and um, iPads um, and Android systems uh, operating systems and any Bluetooth computer connection is called the Tecla. So the actual devices you see there, it's a little box on the left lower corner of the slide. Um, so it can be controlled via switches or for those individuals who are uh, using power wheelchairs, it can actually be connected through the drive controls of their power chair. So this has provided a lot of independence for individuals with spinal cord injury. Um, and being able to control their phones, uh, control their tablets, and control their computers without um, additional assistance from a caregiver or a support person. Um, and this retails for about $400 and is available in our lending library. Uh, moving on, um, computer access. Um, I think this is a, this slide here is providing with some familiar software. So Zoom, Text, and Magic are all um, screen magnification software, and JAWS is uh, a software program for um, being able to navigate the computer for those individuals who have no functional vision. Uh, it's a screen reader software. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but know that those are still available and fully um, available for individuals with vision impairments. Uh, but I do want to, again, remind people, um, because sometimes we forget, um, especially family members and students, need to be educated on the fact that they're, the systems that they're using um, have some built-in accessibility features for those individuals who are using uh, Apple products, iOS products, that there's voiceover, there's ways to control, switch control options in the accessibility feature settings um, that we can make modifications to. Uh, those individuals who have any um, hand loss, uh, function loss, uh, can turn on assistive touch um, and touch accommodations for those individuals who might have hand tremors and not very successful in um, targeting the icons on their touch screen. So those things are built in there. And again, if they need some assistance in being able to set those up, they can always give us a call and we can help them locate it and set those systems up, uh, load those settings up in the, in the devices that they're using. Moving along to reading, um, <clears throat> reading and writing. Again, um, the reading and writing software programs like WordCube, Read and Write, Solo, Win, Kurzweil 3000, Inspiration, and the many more that I'm sure you guys are familiar with are still around. Uh, I want to spend some time on just again emphasizing that we need to match it up depending on the features that the students are going to need. Not all students are going to need everything like uh, other features like on Win or Kurzweil. Sometimes that can be extremely overwhelming for them, but being able to choose a software program with the features that they need, whether that's uh, being able to have uh, OCR qualities for them um, in the event that they need to scan documents. So again, feature matching is significantly important. Um, uh, moving on to a device that's fairly new, came out a couple of years ago, the C-Pen. Um, I've not been a big fan of scanning pens, but actually this handheld OCR scanner um, has demonstrated to be a lot more accurate than the past scanning pens. Um, uh, in the past years, uh, this has been, um, the technology has improved, um, allows a little bit more flexibility in being able to upload some of the content that you're scanning uh, with the pen onto your computers or even smartphones and tablets. So this is another consideration for those students who need some additional support um, for reading. Um, I'm going to be talking about a number of apps here. This is one that I came across called uh, Socratic. Um, this is has a free version. It's available for both iOS and Android. And this has the capacity to provide support in not only in math and science, but as you see here, a number of other uh, school-related subjects such as history and English. And so the um, student would take a picture of their homework problem. So that's using artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence that's built into the, the application helps them figure out the um, the concepts that are needed for them to be able to actually answer the question or the problem that was captured by the camera. Um, so 
this particular uh, application uses a lot of the online resources and shows and pulls up videos through the Khan Academy that I know that uh, my own children are very familiar with. Um, and so this is providing them support in being able to read and getting their, some of their homework explained to them in terms that are um, a lot less confusing. Um, in regards to homework support, um, the two that have been pretty stable in our experience is My Homework Student Planner. This is a free for both iOS and Android. Uh, there is a paid version that gives them um, a little, a few more features, um, such as being able to to sync across platforms and being able to access if the teacher is using it in their class to access some information from their teachers as well. This is a good way for students to keep track of their homework assignments and their tests and their quizzes, um, and gives them a visual representation of it. The other one is iHomework. This one's been around in the App Store for a while. Uh, another way for students to keep track of their homework assignments. Um, and this is, um, I believe, only available though um, for iOS. Inku, another application, specifically, um, they're claiming themselves to be a, a tool specifically for dis, uh, students with dyslexia. This has um, word and phrase prediction, as you see here on the screenshots. Uh, what I like about this, not only does it support multiple um, uh, classes or topics, such as English and math and physics and chemistry, as you see here, but what I like about this particular application is that if you have a student that struggles with spelling, that it has a fairly, a very sophisticated um, spell check in it that even though if they're misspelling a word, it will automatically provide them with um, uh, suggestions on how to spell it, so it's doing a lot of phonetic spelling. Um, and they can actually listen to the word, so it gives them some audio feedback um, before they select the word into their document. Typo, um, uh, this is only available for iOS um, devices. It's about a $12 application. Um, similar to the previous application, it has a, a sophisticated um, spell check system built into it, so it identifies common spelling errors. Um, and it has dictionaries specifically for jargon used in math, physics, and chemistry um, as well. So. Uh, it will also provide the end user the ability to listen to the word before they select it into their document. Um, it also has phrase prediction um, built into the to the application. Voice Dream Reader is a text-to-speech application that is available for iOS uh, for about $15. Um, it has very eloquent voices available to it um, built into the application. This is a really full-featured application that provides um, a lot of uh, support for, for beginner readers and advanced readers. Um, it provides uh, you can make adjustments to the size of the font within, inside the um, application. It also has a very robust um, dictionary and the ability to highlight in different colors um, the word that's being read out loud um, at the time. So the other thing I like about this, I so much that I wrote two slides, is that it supports various document formats, both PDF, um, even PowerPoint, as you see there, and Google Docs. And I know a lot of students' schools are now using Google Docs, um, as well as Bookshare Books. Um, the other thing that it, uh, the, oh, the one thing that it doesn't support is iBooks and um, Kindle uh, formatted books. So this book, I mean, this application is also can be supported for those students who are using VoiceOver. So that's the other um, good feature about it. Moving on to note taking. Um, I think many of us are from very familiar with the LiveScribe Smart Pen, but that's still um, top of, uh, of the list because it's still a very popular um, note-taking tool and one of my still favorites. Um, there's a number of applications that are out there. Um, Notability and AudioNote have been around for a while. The two that I'm going to talk a little bit more um, in depth are SoundNote and WritePad. So SoundNote is, is a $5 app in the App Store. 
it allows you, similar to what the smart live Fire smart pen does, is once you hit record and you start drawing or or typing in your notes, um, uh, you can um, the audio recording is going to be linked into there. You can then email those notes to yourself or transfer them to your to your computer. The other one that I want to highlight is WritePad. This is across two platforms, both iOS and Android, and it runs about $9.99. This is hand um, writing uh, recognition. So as you see on the screenshot, it's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm just let's see. Yeah. Can you turn it back? Um, this, uh, as you can see, the person is just writing on the lower yellow part, and they can see it's it's then converting it to digital text. Um, as they're writing it. So it's one of the few that I've seen that actually does handwriting recognition. Um, and it has a built-in spell checker um, as well, uh, which is a helpful feature. Snap Type Pro, um, iOS only. Um, this is for really designed for, in, for individuals who struggle with writing, the, the physical aspect of writing. So you, they can use the photo or take a photo with their camera. Um, or they can import a document. Uh, and once that document's been imported um, or on the, the, the tablet um, screen, they can draw or type anywhere or even handwrite anywhere in, in that diagram and then save that document um, for later use and later access. Next category is communication. Um, again, many communications out there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about um, speech generating devices. Uh, in our lending library, we have low, medium, and high tech devices. Um, many of them are um, dynamic displays. Uh, but I do want to mention the fact that um, when we're talking about communication, we can also, uh, we have a number of what we call um, speech amplification devices. So for some individuals who have really low volume um, speech, uh, our ability to verbalize, uh, it's really easy for us to set them up with um, amplification devices. And we have a, a number of those in our lending library. Um, as far as uh, speech generating devices, we also have some tactile symbol communicators. And these are for individuals who have vision impairments. Um, and these are devices where you record the message, and then the person or the individual with vision impairments is going to feel um, the, the tactile um, cell that's representative of that recorded message. So again, um, if that is something your students need, uh, we do have these in our, <coughs> excuse me, in our device lending library. The one application that I think we're talking about transition and working with students who are doing some more uh, work um, in the in community in in the community living settings um, is vocabulary. I still have not been able to find another application that actually uses GPS location. So vocabulary is still one of my favorites in this in this regard. Again, for those of you not familiar with it, this uses the GPS um, tracker on the device. Um, and then based on the location that it says that the individual is at, it will populate utterances um, that the person would most likely use at the location. So if they're in a restaurant like Red Robin and it, no it notice the GPS picks up that location, it will populate those utterances in which they would, they would probably and most likely um, use in those kinds of um, environments. So there's a light version. And the uh, full pro version is uh, about $130. And <clears throat> I believe it's only available for iOS. In regards to communication, we can also kind of pull away the importance of social skills. So this um, application is both iOS and Android. And this is called Social Skills Pro. And it provides individuals, uh, students who might have difficult time with, in um, Come striking up a conversation. It gives them topics, what to talk about, gives them some um, ideas of open-ended questions when they're introducing themselves to, to new people, to new friends, etc. Um, it gives them also some in, information on how to understand body language and nonverbal communication, gives them some guidance and information on you know, what to do to be a good listener, um, how to interpret some expressions. Um, so as you see there, uh, 
it can be a helpful tool, especially perhaps for students who tend to be more introverted or have who are socially awkward. Uh, perhaps students that are on the autism spectrum might find this to be a useful tool. And Quick Cues is um, a $5 application in the iOS uh, form, uh, platform only. And this has modules. So this was actually specifically designed for young adults or um, teens who are on the autism spectrum. And similar to the previous application, it helps provide them with um, some suggestions on how to start up a conversation at school um, and different environments, whether it's school or at work, um, even talking on the telephone. So those of you who, um, my children, my teenagers, um, they never are on the phone, so they don't really have a good understanding of telephone etiquette. So I found that feature to be um, very useful because this generation are spending a lot of time communicating through social media and also through text messaging. Hearing devices. So we have um, amplification devices that have been around a long time. So such as the pocket talker or even the personal FM systems that you see on this slide. Um, a lot uh, there are some applications that have been um, developed that have become a little bit more stable than they have been in the past so that individuals can actually, excuse me, let me back up, um, to use their uh, devices um, such as their iPhones or their Android phones um, as amplification tools. So the ones that I noted here, uh, one is called Hear You Now. So when you download that, it's using the microphone on your phone to function as um, it's going to amplify um, environmental sounds. The other one that's across both iOS and Android platforms is U Sound. So similar to, uh, to Hear You Now, your device or your phone can actually um, amplify the, the sounds and conversations that a person has so they might not need to have a dedicated amplification tool. There's captioning um, applications and software available as well. Um, this one is called Caption Call. This actually um, requires that the individual has documentation from a medical professional that certifies that they actually have a hearing loss. But what this does, it captions, um, it, it runs on an iPad. Um, and when they make a call, uh, it captions all of their um, conversations that they're having, gives them information. Also, um, it will caption their voicemails and be able to give them a list of their contacts um, and allow them to make adjustments in the size of the font. So in the event, they also have some visual impairment. The other one I came across in, in um, doing the research for this uh, webinar is called Flipwriter AAC. And for those of you, um, there's a device called a, a UB Duo. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, but the UB Duo actually is a device um, that is two um, devices in one. Um, a person who is deaf or hard of hearing would, would have one, and an eye not being the um, person who with hearing loss would have the other, and we would have rapid texting with each other, um, and each of us could see each other's screen. So what this does, this particular app for, for $50, kind of emulates the UB Duo. So it has a split screen, so I would be typing um, in what I wanted to say to the, my uh, conversation partner. It would the other half of the screen would allow them to read what I'm typing when we're face to face. Um, so uh, that is an option um, that is available for individuals who are working with, with students who are deaf or hard of hearing and um, perhaps they're not, a, uh, not familiar with ASL. Uh, the other one for hearing loss, and we're talking about um, transition and community living is called Brossy. So Brossy is a sound recognition application and it's free. So what you would do is you would go um, on your device and it allows you to record various environmental sounds. Um, whether those sounds are at home or at school like a, a fire alarm bell, um, uh, doorbells, telephone ringing, and then it you can 
set that up through using the microphone on your smartphone. And what it does then when it hears, after that's been set up, if it hears the smoke alarms going off, it will provide the individual who has uh, their smartphone perhaps in their pocket that um, it vibrates and gives them notification or hepatic feedback that um, and it'll grab their phone and it will tell them that the smoke alarms are, are going off um, and that they need to um, leave the building. So this has uh, the capacity to actually um, store uh, a number of sounds, um, whether it's a honking horn um, uh, and so forth uh, within the application and can be very helpful for individuals with hearing loss. Moving on to independent living um, skills. See here. We always advocate that sleep is very important, especially with our students um, and young adults, um, as for and also for ourselves. This one is called Calm, and this is a free application. Um, and <clears throat> what this provides uh, a number of features built into it. It has stories that they can listen to. Um, that they might help them fall asleep. It has breathing exercises that are built into the application that are designed to help with relaxation. There's uh, various musical tracks that are built into the application to help with uh, working on relaxation and sleep and perhaps focus, um, and also some meditation exercises built into the application. Um, the other thing that it has is for those individuals who might not want to listen to certain types of music, but it has some actually some nature sounds and some white noise built into it as well, uh, with the ultimate goal, again, is trying to get them to quiet down their brain um, so that they can um, get a good night's sleep. The other application is called White Noise, and it does is just that, and it's available in um, Android and iOS um, operating system. And this has like um, rainfall, waterfalls, um, uh, various uh, sounds and noises that with the intent of, again, getting the individual to, to quiet down their brain and to get them uh, more um, quickly into sleep um, and re rest and relaxation. Transitioning from sleep to shopping, again, part of um, transition, as, a, we, as I mentioned a little bit ago, is working on an independent living skills. And um, shopping is one of them. So this is called Shopping Light Ease. Um, there's a free version, uh, and I can't remember what the paid version costs, but with the free version, it allows the, um, the user to create grocery lists and checklists, and it can be shared with uh, multiple users, um, for example, various family members. And it can update, um, has real-time um, updating available as long as they have internet connection or cell service. This, um, if it does get updated, for example, if I went to the store and one of my uh, kids added milk, it would notify me that something was added recently to the, my, my list. Um, it provides them with various recipes as well. So if they're entering food in a certain category, it will make suggestions on, on um, what they can make with, with uh, the items on their grocery list. And it has the ability to keep track of what they have in their, in their uh, inventory in their pantry, which is also a good um, Feature. I actually have this on my phone and use it very often. For students who are trying to work on independent living skills and starting to perhaps try to make some of their meals, this is a wonderful app. It's called uh, Photo Cookbook. Um, this gives them all the recipes here are intended to be completed in a half an hour um, or less. Um, it provides them step-by-step -step instructions based on ingredients they would need. Um, there's no difficult technical jargon words that are used. Um, it gives them explanations on um, what uh, what it means to like beat eggs. Um, so some definitions of cooking terms that are built into there, and all of the uh, recipes 
have not only just words, but also uh, very vivid, clear images of, of all the steps that are needed to be completed to have a successful uh, meal at the conclusion of the following the recipes. So this is a free um, application available only on um, iOS devices. Another part of independent living skills is starting to manage medications. So the next two slides are just really talking about some applications that provide that um, increased independence. So this is called Pill Alert. Uh, gives them information on when the, how often they should be taking their medication, the dosage. Um, and there's a built-in calendar so that they can actually log what medications they need to take on certain days. It also will provide some support um, so that if they needed some additional support, perhaps from a family member, um, then they could um, link them into um, using this app so that when they took the medication, a notification would be sent to like their mom or their dad that their medication was taken or not taken. The other one is MedCoach Medication Reminder. Um, this uh, is similar to the previous application, um, so they have very similar features. This one has the data backed up automatically. The other one, you actually have to back it up. Um, uh, that is not something that's automatic. The other thing that this one has, I believe, is yes, it has uh, refill reminders, so that can be set up in this application as well. For money management, I actually have this on my phone. This is called Cash Strap. So you can set up a daily, weekly, or monthly budget, and it keeps track of the money that is spent um, as long as the individual is entering that information. So it's really dependent on um, how well the, uh, the student or the end user is going to be utilizing that. So it's a very simplistic format, um, not complicated and easy to learn. Um, you see the screenshots. That's basically exactly how it looks. So um, if you can start off in doing something uh, like a daily, daily budget, and then advance to more of a monthly budget, depending on on the student's um, capabilities. Money management, uh, um, also debit cards. Um, I actually use this for one of my daughters. Um, she, I set her up with a current credit card. These are debit cards specifically designed for um, teenagers and gives parents a lot more control. So with these cards, you can actually link it in. It's not linked specifically to any of their accounts. What happens is, for example, it's one. My daughter's debit card is linked to. Um, my checking account, and then I transfer money to her debit card uh, for allowances, um, uh, birthday money that she receives. And then I get notifications on what she's spending it on, and so I can then monitor safely um, and teaching her some uh, money management skills at the same time. So I uh, I'm a big believer in, in that system. Uh, Unis Texas is a iOS app, and this is really was designed for individuals with um, moderate, mild to moderate cognitive impairment. It's a phone interface application. So when this is downloaded on the um, Apple phone, the, what it does is it breaks it up into four grids, and the person's uh, their contact list. Uh, they would associate a um, uh, picture with the phone numbers in their contact list. So it allows them to have quick access to phone numbers if they tend to be a person who has challenges with remembering phone numbers. And as you see in the screenshot, if they need immediate help, they actually don't even have to dial 911. They would just hit the, um, the help button that you see on the bottom. The other thing that this particular application does is um, the support person, family member, parent, guardian can actually set up geofencing. So they can set up on the phone that if um, their child or um, goes beyond this street or beyond this boundary, they'll be notified that um, their their child or their student uh, moved beyond their safe zone. 
Um, moving on to transportation, I have actually have this application. It's called Transit. This works best in metropolitan um, areas, not so much in rural environments. This is for both uh, Android and iPhone. What I like about this app, not only does it provide me with the real-time arrivals of like the buses, um, but also trains, so light rail. Um, and it also gives me um, connection directly to Uber, so ride-sharing um, uh, programs like Lyft and Uber. Um, it tells me, uh, gives me a lot of options within the app without actually having to leave the app and go to different um, websites or uh, other applications. Like if I wanted to, to <clears throat> excuse me, hire a Lyft, I can actually just stay in this application and um, uh, call uh, Rideshare uh, for myself. So take a look at that if that's appropriate. The other one that can be helpful um, for students who are taking when you're working with transportation, on transportation is these navigation tools called Wake Me Up Near, Omnibus, or GPS Alarms. So this works on GPS locations. So if you have students riding like the bus um, and they have a tendency to forget when they're supposed to get off, having these um, navigation applications on their smart devices can be really helpful because uh, they would enter um, their location or their bus stop. And as they get close to their bus stop, location, it's going to start giving them both auditory and or um, tactile feedback that their bus stop is, is, um, is getting close and that they should be, pay closer attention. I think it's also important that when we're talking about transition that there's um, being able to understand um, events in both local um, within their community as well as perhaps national um, and international. So these websites and applications offer kid uh, friendly kid level um, information in regards to the news. So the Huff, Huff Post, so Huffington Post for teens, uh, PBS has uh, a website specifically for young readers as does CNN. Um, and another one is Newzella and News to You. So again, these websites, um, and many of them not only have websites, but also corresponding applications where our teens can actually get um, information about current events um, that might impact their life. Organization and memory, um, reminder. Uh, so this is called Reminder with Voice Reminders. Um, it sets up, as you see here, weekly, uh, monthly, or even yearly um, uh, tasks that can be set up. Um, this is free for both iOS and Android. Picture schedule has been around a while. I can customize this with uh, pictures from my photo album or upload it from the um, internet. So it provides me a lot of flexibility there. So it really depends on what the student is going to be um, work best for the student. And it also has video um, capability that I can insert there as well. So multimedia um, capacity for, for um, task management. I'm cruising through these because I'm realizing I'm running out of time. Stop, breathe, and think. Um, another um, way to work on stress management and mindfulness, uh, we do a whole training on cognition and mental health um, here at WATAP. Um, and we really emphasize the use of self-management tools in trying to manage um, stress and anxiety. Um, for math, I came across PhotoMath and MathAway. These both work in a way that you actually use a camera on your device. Uh, you take a photo of the problem, and it provides step-by-step -step instruction on how to solve the problem. And it actually works very well. Um, my daughter actually uses photo math that you see here. Okay. Um, and for vision, um, we've talked. Uh, we have a number of um, e-readers, scan readers, OCR devices, and magnifiers. Uh, these are the ones that are 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 um, in our in our inventory. But I want to say about. There, these devices that if you're working with students who need this kind of magnification, um, there are devices that are available for them to do near 
um, up close magnification as well as distance magnification. So there are devices that allow them to perhaps magnify if they need to um, the whiteboard or the blackboard that the teacher is using in the classroom. So keep that in mind. Handheld magnifiers, which you see in the lower right hand corner, provide a lot of mobility and flexibility for students who need to have that additional magnification um, and have it to be transportable. The OrCam glasses, we're actually going to get these in our lending library. This is a wearable device. It's OCR, so the device you see is worn on a pair of glasses. It um, allows us, the end user, to capture an image, and that image will be read out loud to the person. Um, and it works, uh, it works very, very well. Um, so it works for individuals who have low vision as well as for individuals who have print disabilities. Um, seeing AI, um, this is a free app on iOS. This allows real-time capturing of images and pictures, and for it'll capture text and read the text out loud to an individual. So this works very well. Um, it's, again, only available for iOS. It also has facial recognition, um, and so you can actually store faces and for those individuals who tend, have a tendency to forget people's names. So, and it also has, they're starting to work on handwriting recognition as well. That tends to be a little bit more quirky. InVision, is, InVision AI is similar to seeing AI, but this is subscription-based. Um, this um, has more features than seeing AI and a little bit more stable. Um, and I believe it's about $5 a month for the subscription-based program. Okay, so the goal again is functional outcomes, and I erased through those last couple of slides, and I apologize for that. Um, and again, uh, I encourage you to contact us, and I want to reemphasize the fact when we're talking about students in transition that we need to have everybody on board and working from the same goal and plan um, that the, so that uh, the student, the staff, and the family are, are um, we're working from the same plan so that the individual, the student in this case, um, has a lot of buy-in with their technology and so that we aren't wasting anybody's time and or uh, funding resources. So with that, I, um, I will again thank you for tuning in and I'd be happy to answer any questions at this point.